So what a year 2021 has been. <laughs> I haven't made a video on here in uh, almost a year, I think. I think I did a prayer last January, um, which was going to be a blessing upon 2021. And oh man, I had a brutal, brutal year. So uh, I'm getting things back together, have a little free time now, been fixing up the place. I actually have time to do some painting. So here are a couple of paintings that I am working on currently. And uh, this is one that I'm currently working on today. I have a couple of angels. Here's a scene of Jesus at the, uh, at the cross. I guess it's an Easter painting of sorts. And uh, so I've been working on this one. And uh, so all together, uh, I wanted to make a video that had something to do with um, the idea of the Nephilim and uh, where they are today. You know, what are they doing? Uh, these are spirits of the fallen angels and human women that are immortal, pretty much. I mean, they're going to end up on a lake of fire um, as their punishment at the end of time. But uh, up until then, where are they now? You know, have they inhabited human beings again? Are they just floating around? Are they in pigs? You know, like Jesus threw all those demons, the legion, into pigs? Um, I don't think so. I think they're in very important positions in this world right now. And they're causing all kinds of chaos and mischief. And most of them are probably billionaires um, or they're famous movie stars or whatever. But anyway, I just wanted to do a quick video on that and uh, also about Nimrod and uh, cover a few topics like that. So bear with me and uh, enjoy. Okay, so where are the Nephilim today? Where do they hide? We're gonna take a look at this. You remember Nimrod? Nimrod was a giant of a man. Nimrod was very good with animals, a hunter before the Lord. And then there was Og of Bashan. He was a giant. He had a 14 foot iron bed. How big were these guys? How big did they get? Did they get bigger than that? I'm gonna quote from the Jewish Book of Jubilees only because I have a bunch of Jewish friends who are truthers who know the story they know all this stuff and it said and it came to pass when the children of men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the angels of god saw them on a certain year of this jubilee that they were beautiful to look upon and they took themselves wives of all whom they chose and they bare unto them sons and lawlessness increased on the earth and all flesh corrupted its way alike men and cattle and beasts and birds and everything that walketh on the earth all of them corrupted their ways and their orders and they began to devour each other this sounds like the book of enoch now remember people were vegetarians before the flood so if they're devouring each other and other animals that's new. And lawlessness increased on the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of all men was thus evil continually. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, and all flesh had corrupted its orders, and all that were upon it, the earth had wrought all manner of evil before his eyes. I include this picture because back before the flood they were messing around with humans and insects and animals and they were creating hybrids human fish hybrids shimmera you're creating the sphinx a female head on a lion's body this was the corruption of the nephilim and the nephilim spirits and they are indestructible they cannot die because they are part angel or fallen angel so let me sidestep for one second. The Nephilim and the fallen angels were playing around with DNA. They were transforming human beings and other animals. And they were fighting each other, the Bible says, in the Book of Jubilees and Jasher. And they were eating human beings. So they became carnivores. They invented the eating of meat. So doesn't it make sense that maybe these guys were monkeying around with DNA may have modified lizards to create pit bulls like the T-Rex? To guard themselves against each other and against human beings i mean it makes sense to me maybe that's why 
T-Rexes were around before the Flood. They made other things as well that were as equally as horrifying that may have even survived the Flood. Just a thought on this. So they played around with the DNA, with the molecular structures, and they knew how to splice and divide and create new things, things that were ungodly. So came the flood of Noah. It wiped out all life on earth except for Noah and his sons and the animals aboard the ark. Genesis 10, 1 through 32. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood, and the whole earth was one language and of one speech. So after Nimrod fell, and the speech was divided, and cultures were divided, they needed a way to communicate with each other. They needed a sign language. Nimrod challenged God. So we're going to take a look at Nimrod. We're going to take a look at Babel and the fall of Babel. Jeremiah 50 says, The word that the Lord spake against Babylon and against the land of the Chaldeans. So who exactly are the Chaldeans? The Chaldeans live in Babylon and they serve King Nebuchadnezzar at the time that he is king. And they are asked by King Nebuchadnezzar, you may recall, to not only interpret a dream that he had, but also to tell him what the dream was, which is pretty much impossible because how could anybody read somebody's mind? No one can do that. Well, except for God, of course. You may recall that the dream had to do with the statue. And that statue, according to the Chaldeans, answered before the king and said there is not a man among the earth that can show the king matter therefore there is no king lord nor ruler that would even ask such a thing of a magician or an astrologer or a chaldean Whew. but there's daniel and daniel does it and there was a woman of course who was the mother and the queen and the goddess of babylon Semiramis with her baby tammuz Semiramis was married to Nimrod. She was the queen of Babylon. And people came to worship Semiramis, who is also called Easter. She is Gaia, Astroth, Ishtar, Artemis. She was Venus, Aphrodite, depending on the culture you were in and how God separated the cultures. She's Mother Nature. People worshipped Semiramis. And she was married to Nimrod, who was, in fact, a Nephilim giant, or had the spirit of a Nephilim inside him, among other things. She is the moon goddess. According to the historian Asubius, Semiramis was the wife of Nimrod. She publicly declared that upon Nimrod's death, he had been resurrected as the god of the sun, as the sun god. Nimrod used his sun rays to miraculously inseminate Semiramis with a child. So this is kind of the Jesus story, but on the dark side. And this is Apollo. Apollo is Nimrod. And here is the worship of Apollo as he rides his sun chariot across the earth. Remember that Apollo appears in Revelation as well. Apollyon, the keeper of the keys of the bottomless pit. And here's the sign of Apollo. It's the sun sign. It's the swastika. The Aryans used the swastika to invade almost every nation on this planet at one time. Every nation has the swastika. All the way from Tibet to Japan to England, everywhere you can look, you find the swastika, the sun symbol. Sig Heil. The German phrase Sig Heil means Hail to the Sun. And I think I've mentioned this in an earlier video. It's the cult of the Sun, the cult of Nimrod. 
the cult of Apollo, they still worship the sun in India, and they still use the swastika. The Aryans invaded India, northern India, and here is Osiris in Egypt, the sun god Osiris, and here's Isis, the moon goddess, or Semiramis, and their son Tammuz. So what does Tammuz stand for, and what does he become? You've got the alternative Jesus, Tammuz, or Baal. He was called Baal. And remember that people were, during the time of the Israelites, worshiping Baal and offering their firstborn children to Baal. Now, Tammuz is also called Cupid in Greek mythology, or in the Greek, uh, <laughs> it's not mythology, it's real. And Cupid had a human lover named Psyche. And that's where we derived psychology or the study of psyche. She's a human woman with this divine Nephilim husband and she has offspring and she eventually meets Pan and she has a love affair and children with Pan as well. And I've done a whole video on this if you're interested in going in depth on Pan and psyche. So Semiramis is said to have been born out of an egg, and this is where Easter comes from. Her name was Easter as well. So she's born from an egg out of the Euphrates River. This is very similar, of course, to the goddess Venus in Greek mythology, who was born out of water as well, giving birth to Tammuz. And here's Venus on her half shell being bored as a, born as a goddess. There's the Indian goddess mother. Here's Simiramis with her bunny buddy, <laughs> your Easter with her rabbit. And here she is as the moon goddess. Now she had rituals that went along with her uh, worship and every year the virgins um, would be inseminated by the chief priests and they uh, got together inseminated these virgins and when they had children which was about the time we worship Easter every year in the spring those children were then sacrificed to Baal or to, or to Tammuz and what they did was they took those babies they sacrificed them and they dipped eggs in the blood of the sacrificed children. And that's where we got Easter eggs. And here they are offering a sacrifice to Baal. This is the Israelites, the northern Israelites, whom God banished to Babylon, by the way. And here he is, the young Tammuz, or Baal. So back to Babylon. Now I've heard that in Tibet, there is a mountain that has been unexplored and archeologists have not touched it yet, that is actually carved at the top. And it's carved almost like a pyramid, probably the largest pyramid on the planet. And could this have been the Tower of Babel? It's very possible. The locals in Tibet say that there is an eye carved on the side of this mountain under the snow somewhere, according to their folklore. So it's very possible as the highest point on earth, or one of the highest points on earth, Mount Kailash in Tibet might be the Tower of Babel, where Nimrod challenged God. And as a result, God tore down and disbanded Babylon and separated the languages, and so they had to depend upon sign languages. We're going to get to that in a little bit later. And that's how you tell where the Nephilim are and who they are today. So the great empire of Babylon fell, 
and everyone was scattered, and in South America there are thousands of these pyramids that popped up. The Mayans, the ancient Mayans, suddenly appear, worshipping dragons, worshipping the sun, building pyramids, and sacrificing children. Thousands of children's bodies found at the sites of these pyramids, and here they worship the dragon and the Mayan sun god, Nimrod. So they spread around the world, but they kept some basic parts of the culture. And this is the headdress of the Pope. And we're going to talk about where this comes from and how this relates to Semiramis and Nimrod and Pergamon. Pergamon, Jesus spoke about in Revelation to the church of Pergamon, to the angel of the church of Pergamon, write, Jesus said, these are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword, which is Jesus. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. So where is Pergamon? Pergamon today is Istanbul, one of the largest cities on the planet. And it was also called Constantinople, where King Constantine ruled and reigned. So what went on in Pergamon? Oh, there's the Temple of Esther, or Semiramis. And Julius Caesar, when he conquered Rome, decided that he wanted to be a divine being, and so he went to Pergamon. And there he met the Babylonian elders, the chief priests of the Babylonian mystery religion, which is the religion of Tammuz. And he took the headdresses from those priests, the Pontiff Maximus headdresses, and he took it for himself so that he could become the high priest of the mystery religion. He was then worshiped. And that went on for year after year. Augustus Caesar, his son, took on the mantle of Pontifex Maximus, and every Roman emperor after that became the Pontifex Maximus, the high priest of the Tammuz mystery religion, the Nimrod religion. And this carried on for the Roman emperors between 63 BC and the 4th century AD. They were the Pontifex Maximus, the highest bridge maker, and the bridge maker was Nimrod. Nimrod wanted to create a bridge to heaven so that he could conquer heaven and become the king of heaven himself, become the god of gods. So what happened was when Constantine became the emperor, he forced all of his soldiers in Pergamon to become Christians, and he renamed the city Constantinople. And he took that headdress the headdress of the Pontifex Maximus, and he gave it to the Pope in Rome. And the Popes in Rome from then on became the, the Maximus, the Pontifex Maximus. And they wear that same headdress today. They are the high priest of the mystery religion. They are Babylon. Mystery Babylon the Great, Revelation says. And we all know what happens to Babylon in the final days. Within one day, Babylon will fall. Mystery Babylon the Great. And the whole earth will mourn its loss. Semiramis, Queen of Heaven, Mother of Harlots, as mentioned in the book of Revelation by Jesus as well, she rides the beast. And who did the, the uh, Pope named the Queen of Heaven? As Mary. Mary commands Jesus in heaven and tells him what to do, pretty much, because she is divine, according to the Pope. She's a divine being, according to Roman Catholicism and the Roman Catholic Church. This is Babylon. And the teachings of Babylon. So how screwed are we here? <laughs> yes, we still celebrate Easter. 
Semiramis Day and we still decorate eggs and have our children play around with baskets and search for them on our lawns. And the Pope still keeps his fancy headdress right out of Babylon. Let's take a quick look at Nimrod. Now Nimrod is the grandson or the great grandson of Noah, so he has direct contact with Noah. And remember God in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned and were naked, created clothes for Adam and Eve out of animal skins. And the story is, according to the book of Jasher or Jubilees, that these skins were handed down a couple of generations to Noah and Noah took them aboard the ark. And that might be how he got the animals to come on the ark and how he managed to handle and command the animals on the ark. It doesn't say that in the Bible, but this is what it alludes to in the book of Jubilees and the book of Jasher. Now, if Nimrod had those skins, that's how he became a hunter before the Lord. The Bible does say that he was or had power over animals and he was a great hunter. He was a mighty man. So he had first-hand knowledge of God and he chose to rebel. He's the first rebellion after the Ark lands. And he goes ahead, here it says Nimrod, he became a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said by people, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And Nimrod decided that he wanted to become the Lord. So here then is the language used by the Nephilim today, those undying spirits of the Nephilim that inhabit the earth. And if you were a Nephilim spirit and you inhabited the earth, who would you want to be? Wouldn't you want to be somebody famous, rich and powerful, able to influence the world? So here in fact are all those Babylonian mystery religion symbols cultivated and used by famous people like Charles Darwin. Every movie star in Hollywood sold their soul as required by whatever law they have in the mystery religions to use the symbolism to identify themselves